pleased that you guys chose the topic of turning points for this TEDx. So I think it's a really interesting topic, and I think it's really timely right now. Because our generation, so I'm talking to people under the age of 34 and, um, and in the teens, yes, we're in the same generation, is notorious for delaying our turning points. Um, it's all over the news. Millennials, that's what our generation is called. We're also called Generation Y, because we follow Generation X. Um, uh, it's just, just known for delaying adulthood. We're taking our turning points really slow. Slow, so slow, that we've actually been called the boomerang generation because many of us start at home and then we leave and then we boomerang right on back. And this isn't hype. I mean, you know, we get, we, I think people love to hate us for this, but it's actually true. The Pew Research Center has done a lot of work on this. And if they've looked at things like sort of classic turning points, like getting married and having kids, and we're doing those things later. So in 1960, the median age at which men and women uh, got married was 23 and 21, respectively. Now it's 26 and 28. And the share of adults or 20-somethings who were married back in the 60s was like 60%, and now it's 20%. So many fewer people in their 20s are, are getting married. And with kids, it's the same. So the, the average age of the of first-time moms is going up. Um, and, the, and this is true across the country uh, in all states. It's, it's gone up over the last 30 or 40 years. And the number of women having their first child after the age of 30 has also gone up, and this is true for all races and um, major cultural groups. It's kind of interesting, I thought. And so I, I wanted to look into this, and because I work in radio, I, I started convincing my friends to talk to me about it, because they represent this demographic. And even the people who seem to be hitting their turning points at the you know, right time, people with kids and whatever in their, their 20s, um, didn't necessarily have a totally conventional life. So here's, here's my friend Ted talking about his life. He's 30, he has two kids, he's married, he has a house. If, if I'm trying to think about like if there's a transition moment where I felt more of a grown-up or less of a grown-up, it didn't necessarily come with the birth of our first child. We were 27, we were still in graduate school, and we actually had a roommate when he was born. And they kept that roommate for a while. So this is sort of unconventional, doing it a little bit differently than his parents had done it. Um, another major turning point that people use to measure whether you're an adult is whether you've moved out, basically. And as I said, a lot of people in our generation have moved back in, 40% actually, in the last couple years. And people talk about this related to the recession. It's understandable, right? But if you look at the graphs, it's also changed over time for most age groups, people are moving back home. And what I've noticed in talking to people is that there's some confusion about what this means. It feels like people are adults because they're 30 years old, I'm 30, but some things about my life and about my peers' lives don't seem to match up with our expectation of what adulthood is. Um, I think my friend Martin sort of says it best in talking about his own life and his own sort of mixed feelings about this. There's a part of me that does feel like more adult than a lot of the adults that I meet and that this wandering time has afforded me a real like luxury of getting to know myself. And then there's a part of me that's like, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm still a, a child being almost about to be 30 because I have I have a loose job, I don't have health insurance, I have no career stability, I have no sense of what my life will be like in six months. None of like the, the physical symbols of adulthood. And that's the interesting thing about turning points, is they're often used as a way to measure where we are in life, but our generation isn't hitting those turning points at the time that previous generations have, and we're left a little confused. And so I started thinking, well, is there a way to think about this in, in sort of take, get the bigger picture? Are there more essential characteristics of being a grown-up? And you know, I'm not the, the first person to think about this. A lot of great art and literature 
um, and culture has been about this. You know, I think Lena Dunham's contributions to this topic are, are I really think they are um, immense. But interestingly, the field that I work most closely with, science, hasn't really taken this on in the way that I think maybe uh, could be done. So, you know, there's no one, there's not like a group of scientists holed up in Geneva searching for the elusive adulthood, right? <laughs> but that's kind of weird to me because it's something that we all face. It's, it's a transition that if you're lucky enough to make it to adulthood, you, you probably have to think about. Um, so I think science may have something to offer here. And there are a few psychologists who are looking at this, but it really is kind of piecemeal and satellite. And I, so, so I'm convinced that science must have some, something to share. And I think the reason I'm convinced about that is because I've in, been indoctrinated by my own job. Um, and as you heard in the intro, I work for this science radio show called Science Friday. And how many people have heard, heard the show or heard of it? That's incredible. I usually think of our audience as like over the age of 80. So <laughs> I'm really pleased. <laughs> Um, so it's a live science talk show. It's broadcast on NPR. Um, it amazes me that a live science talk show is considered entertainment outside of my own geeky world, but it is. And even better than that, it's been on the air for over 20 years. The guy who started it is this guy, Ira Flato. So for the last 23 years, on Friday afternoons from 2 to 4, he sits in a chair like that and asks scientists about what they do. And I think the guiding, one of the guiding principles at Science Friday is that science can help you navigate your life. Science isn't just something in a textbook. It's not asking esoteric, irrelevant questions. It's the most relevant. And we find science everywhere, including like at the Thanksgiving Day Macy's Parade. That's me behind the enormous hand I'm filming. Um, and that's what I do for Science Friday mostly. I make videos for our website, and then I chat about them on the radio. And I've found every time I pick up the phone that people are studying science that's very relevant to me, and that it, in just unusual places. So here's an example from some of the videos I've done recently um, that I think that illustrates this. Bicycles are beautiful, like the stars are beautiful. And one likes to stare at the stars and wonder how they work. And we like to stare at bicycles and wonder how they work. You know, when you stare at a flame, you, you kind of can't help but wonder, what the heck is that thing? <laughs> there are different ways of getting water in. That's kind of fascinating. And any time I look at any insect, it's doing something that I couldn't even begin to design a robot or a machine to do. And the insect is doing it faster, easier, more precisely, and more accurately than I can imagine. Science is everywhere. If science can help me understand how my dog behaves at the water bowl, I do think it should help me be able to help me understand what it means to be an adult. The other reason why I think science may have something to offer here is because I've sort of taken on a topic like this um, in the past. Along with uh, reporter Joe Palka at NPR, I wrote a book dedicated to annoyingness, and I say with equal measure of um, pride and shame that this was my idea, that it'd be a great idea to write a whole book about annoyingness, which is just intrinsically a kind of petty <laughs> topic. Um, but what I learned from that were, were two things. One, there was a ton of science that was relevant to my anno annoyances, from skunk spray to cell phone chatter, and so you could apply science to question this sort of question, even though most people don't, even though there's not, again, not a, a department of annoyingology anywhere. And I also learned, and on a more personal turning point note, that you can do projects like this. That it's possible to dream up an idea and then do it, even though it's really hard <laughs> And even though we were making it up as we went along, I mean, not the content of the book, but how to do it, we didn't know how to write a book. We didn't know how to take on a subject that no one has considered really in a scientific way, or most people haven't. So it was possible. And I think that experience gave me the courage to think about adulthood in this way, too. So I want to share with you 
my most tantalizing finding so far. I was looking for ways to think about adulthood by zooming out. And I, my go-to is evolutionary biology, because if you ever want context on your life, just go to geologic time, and you'll feel really insignificant. And it, it worked well for this, too. Um, and I think I'll let uh, Stephen Jay Gould do some of the talking here. He's a famous evolutionary biologist. And he says, human evolution has emphasized one feature of this comet primate heritage, delayed development, particularly as expressed in late maturation and extended childhood. Let me just translate that. What makes us human, or one of the things that makes us human, is that it takes us a really, really long time to grow up. And once we get there, we're kind of babyish. We're really curious, we like to play, we cry tears of sadness. These are characteristics that are usually associated with children. But humans are different. Now consider that in the context of the millennial generation. It casts a slightly different light, I think, on this idea that it's bad to take your time. Because what Gould argues, and other people too, like Lewis Boak, is that it's not just what makes us human, but it's partly what has made us successful as a species. Because if you grow for a longer amount of time, your brain can get bigger. And in fact, humans are programmed not to be, or not to do, but to learn. And that makes us really good at adapting to our environment. And that makes us better able to withstand changes to our environment. And these guys argue that that's partly why we've become the species we've become. That's why we can do things like look for the Higgs boson, or travel to the moon, or go back in time and recreate history of the dinosaurs, or wage war against microbes we can't even see, or map the human genome project. Why? Because it takes us a long time to grow up. I thought that was a pretty powerful idea, at least related to my own life. And it has helped me think about my own navigation of the world slightly differently. And I'll just give you an example um, of my sort of biggest turning point at least in my work, which is working at Science Friday. I mean, that's really what I've done since I've graduated from college. So I just want to tell you how I got that job and how I got here. I, um, I started out as a listener. So I graduated from college, and I was working in a lab. And I, I was in Italy at the time. And this is, I've told this story a lot, but it, I still feel like kind of embarrassed about it. So I didn't have a lot of friends in, in Italy. And on Friday nights, it was Friday afternoon in the US, and I listened to a lot of Friday, a lot of Science Fridays, because that was what was on. And I grew to really love the program so much that I emailed Ira Flato, the host, and was like, hey, I'm totally ready to work for you. <laughs> and he was like a normal person and was like, who are you? But you know, we do offer internships if you want to come be an indentured servant um, and work for free, sure, we'd love to have you. So I went, I moved to New York. Um, this was my one big idea. I was sort of betting the house on it and, um, and it didn't like so easily, it didn't really like work out. <laughs> I was an intern for six months. Other interns had sort of been there and, and gone and gotten jobs and I was kind of hanging on and I was running out of money so I'm applying to other work and I remember I got offered a job and I, I went to Ira, and I was like, well, should I take it? And he was like, yeah, you probably should. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> now I have to take it. <laughs> so uh, so I, I took another job. And, but I really wanted to work there, so I kept listening to the show. And every time Ira would say something on the air, which he occasionally would, like, what do you want to see in our website? Sort of a hypothetical question, but I would answer <laughs> with ideas. And I think eventually I wore him down. I mean, it took months, but he eventually called me and was like, OK, Flora, well, let's see. Why don't you come and work for us? But that wasn't the turning point. Um, because when I started my job, I was terrible at my job. We didn't know what we were doing on the web. We, we, hadn't, we started doing vid videos because we thought that was a good idea. I had never made a video. 
there were years in there where I was just terrified every day that I was going to lose my job. Because frankly, I, didn't, I wasn't doing great. And I watched my colleague, my friends, um, and my peers from college go to graduate school and then graduate from graduate school. And I'm still sort of feeling like I'm floundering at Science Friday, and I can't tell if I'm moving anywhere. Um, and I worried, was I hitting my turning points at the right time? Was I sort of accomplishing what I needed to be accomplishing? Um, and I'm so glad that I didn't let that anxiety push me off the track, because what turned out to be true is that I was making a turn. It just was so incremental and so slow that I couldn't perceive it. But now I look back and I'm certain of it, because it's a lot easier for me to make videos these days. Now I get to talk about them on the air. And actually, yesterday, I got to fill in for Ira for two hours on the show. And that's a huge difference from where I started. Clearly, a turn happened in there, but it took a really long time. And so now, every time I sort of wonder, am I, am I stacking up? Am I moving quickly enough? Um, I try to think about the sea turtle. Because if humans compared themselves as a species to other species, we would get blown out of the water by basically every other species on the planet, like the loggerhead. The loggerhead, the day that it is born, it hatches out of its egg, it waddles over to the water, which it has to find itself, and then swims for 20 hours till it's offshore, and then it continues to fend for itself for every day of its life, starting minute one. You've met babies. <laughs> They're not doing that. I'm 30, and I'm like just moving out to sea. So I think that's, that's the point. Next time you, you're wondering if you're moving at the right speed or something like that, just think about, about the turtle and how, for humans, part of our secret sauce is that we take it slow. <laughs>